This is a continuation to the response to Rabbi Asher Meza, which I didn't get a chance to do previously. Now I'm able to respond to the following text that he brought to my attention in his video, A Jew Disproves Christianity in Five Minutes, Consider Judaism. Firstly, I want to look at some texts that have a close connection to each other in terms of the phrase, mercy not sacrifice. This can be found in the following texts. Psalm 51.16 You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken contrite spirit. You, God, will not despise. Psalm 40, verse 6 Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Hosea 6.6 6. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. These three texts do not suggest that God is against sacrifices in and of themselves, nor a denial of them. In fact, Samuel even met, says a similar thing, that to heed God's voice and to obey it is better than sacrifice, many sacrifices. But this is not a denial of sacrifice. Although God prefers to have our constant unflinching obedience, these texts don't even suggest what my rabbinic friend is suggesting which is a denial of blood atonement as the only means. Next, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Amen to that text, but why quote it? Sacrifices don't have to be constantly mentioned every single time. The psalm is, t is about David speaking about the goodness of God to those who seek him and love him. The sacrifices are not relevant to the context of the passage whatsoever. Proverbs 28.13 Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. I think every person is aware of this principle all too well. And it is a true statement. Like Psalm 34, sacrifices are not relevant to the point the writer is trying to make. The verse itself is a warning to us to admit our wrongdoing and turn from it. After all, David in Psalm 32 comments on how he wasted away because he didn't confess his sin. And hyper-grace people love to come up with this rubbish of not needing to confess their sins. <laughs> now how this verse proves the point of the rabbi, I am still uncertain. Some other text that the rabbi quotes includes the following. Micah 6.6 6. With what shall I come before the Lord, and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Jeremiah 7.22 For when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, and spoke to them, I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but I gave them this command, Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. First, it is important to understand why this is mentioned in both texts. The reason the Lord was displeased with the sacrifices was because the people were deliberately abusing the sacrificial system so they could live in sin. The sacrifices were rendered unacceptable because there was no repentance accompanying them. Without repentance, the sacrifice is useless, which even the New Testament and the Talmud affirm. Hebrews 10.26 in the New Testament if we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice of sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment, and the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished un who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who is treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. The Talmudic reference, Yoma 87a. I shall sin, and the day of atonement shall procure atonement. Then the day of atonement does not procure atonement. Shall we say that our Mishnah is not in accord with Rabbi? For Rabbi said it was taught for all transgressions of biblical commandments, whether you repented or not, whether positive or negative. Does the day of atonement procure atonement? You may even say it will be in agreement with Rabbi. It is different when he relies on it. 
Both ref now, both references I've provided show that repentance is required for a sacrifice. My point is, it was the abuse of the sacrifice that God was condemning in Jeremiah 7 and Micah 6. The next text is found in Hosea 14.2. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. It's funny that this text is even being quoted by the rabbi, when in Hosea's day the temple was still standing. This text doesn't even suggest that a mere utterance of your, from your mouth is even an offering for your sin. It's simply a gross of abuse of the text that is being employed. The same thing is done with 1 Kings 8.38, but if you read the text carefully it says, starting from verse 37, When the famine or play comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and whenever a prayer or pleas made by anyone among the people of Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts, and spreading out their hands towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, forgive and act, deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts. For you alone know every human heart. So they will fear you all the time they live in the land you gave our ancestors. And li like Hosea 14, it is in a context when the temple is still standing in the very verses he mentions to his audience. Or rather, the reference he mentions to his audience for us to research. Numbers 16.46 is the next section. Then Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put incense in it, along with burning coals from the altar, and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people. But Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the land, sorry, the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague, in addition to those who had died because of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the tent, entrance to the tent of meeting, for the plague had stopped. It was suggested by Usher Mazer, although he didn't say it, but I think it's implied by what he's saying, that incense can be used as atonement rather than blood alone. I spoke with Nat Demon regarding this text. And what he said was, and he said this also about Daniel 4, Lastly, we come to Job 33.26, and that person can pray to God and find favor with him. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to full well-being. This particular chapter doesn't raise the issue of atonement within the context of the chapter, nor is the issue of sacrifice raised, as it's not relevant to Elihu's point of seeking God. And again, this goes back to a point I made earlier about Psalm 34 and Proverbs 28. I hope this video has provided an adequate response to Asher Mazer, and I hope it's been a blessing for you. But I urge you one thing. Check out what I am saying with others. Study the truth for yourselves. Take care, and thanks for watching.